So what I want to do is I want to kind of get this into my head a bit better. Yeah. All right. So if you haven't already seen, um, just did a, um, a discussion with for about uh, half an hour explaining the, this conceptualization of schema therapy. Um, and I think I've almost got it in my head. All okay. right. Um, but the purpose of this discussion is to make sure I've got it in my head. Yeah. Okay. So I want you to kind of help me out where I stumble. Okay. All right. Okay. So the, the, the kind of premise of this is that we're all walking around with a vulnerable child. Yep. Okay. Everyone's got vulnerability. And, and that vulnerability is peculiar to me. Peculiar to me? Is my vulnerability yep. and it's different to your vulnerability. Yep. And it's based on, um, you know, the, the whole milieu of experiences I had as a mm -hmm. child. Okay, so that's, so that's, I've got that in me and I'm getting around and uh, mostly coping. Okay, but then something happens. Okay, something happens. So um, there might be something happening in my environment. Yeah. Okay, that kind of stirs up something in my vulnerable child. Yeah, so we, we call it a trigger is probably the easiest way to do it. It's something would trigger the vulnerable child. Or cue. <laughs> okay. Okay. So there's some sort of external cue, all yeah. right. So it, and I guess you know the classic it would be probably an invalidation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So someone says something that makes me that hurts my feelings that makes me feel yep. bad about me or doesn't say something that they should have or whatever something yep. like that. There's some sort of some sort of invalidation happens and that stirs up something in me. Yeah. Okay. Bang. So now I'm stirred up. All right. So now I will reflexively react in some way. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's where these different um, schema modes, yeah. okay, yeah. come in. So, for example, I might attack that bully attack. Yep, that's and that, an option. And that might be my go-to. That just might be how I how yeah. I get around in my life. Yeah. And most, I'm, I'm bully attack most of the time. Yeah. Occasionally I do other stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, so all right, so I'm with, I think I'm with you there. All right, so so something happens in my external environment, and I go to whichever it is, and I, I'll have more or less a, de a default mode. Um, so what would you say? Would you say? Sorry, would you say that? You, you mostly use one or two of these, or how do you... It'll, it'll depend on the situation. Most people will probably have, I'd say, on average, maybe top four working with patients, as you'd see kind of their top four in terms of their kind of default cluster. Yeah. And it would depend on kind of maybe you've got one or two fight or one or two flight, depending on what your preference is. Most of us have a, a bit of a compliance surrender in there, but that's pretty far down the totem pole. But what we... I just want to point out, what we actually call it is mode flipping. Okay? So... Something would happen in the environment that's that punitive parent that comes in and says, see, you stuffed up. I told you this would happen. You always stuff up. Yeah. That then that's, on, that's what we're here. That's, that's what the vulnerable child hears. That, yeah, coming yeah. from the punitive parent, yeah. right? So the internal voice of that kind of ongoing kind of script of all that negativity, that's your first mode, that then triggers or kind of draws up that vulnerable child. So we flip into vulnerable child and go, oh, God, that hurts. No, I don't want to feel this. And mm -hmm. so we flip into a coping mode. Mm -hmm. And, and this is reflexive. Like oh, yeah, this happens it's in, quick. In my, it's yeah. quick. Yeah, okay. So then, then I flip into whatever mode and that, then I survive the situation or, or yeah. otherwise. Okay, yeah. so it gets me through the situation. Yeah. And so, okay, so I've got my sort of go-tos that I tend to go to. Um, and what I, I guess what I took from this is we're probably doing a lot of this stuff by default and we're mindless of it. Yes. In terms, well, we don't have a label for it. Yes. It's just stuff we do. Yeah. Okay. So I guess one thing about uh, understanding these different modes is now one can go, oh, hang on, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm being a perfectionistic overcompensator and I'm not getting any sleep and I'm not yeah. attending to my other stuff because I'm so overcompensating yeah. at work or whatever. Yeah. Okay, but I can recognise that in myself. Yeah. All right. And now what I can do is try and turn that down a bit. Yeah. Okay, and the act of me turning that down a bit, I guess that I guess that's me engaging in healthy adult or good yeah, parent. No, or? no, no, no. It'd be the healthy adult. Okay, so yeah. if it's so, let's say I I stuff up at work. The voice in the back of my head says, "You always stuff up. You always make mistakes. You're never good enough." That triggers a vulnerability. I then flip into perfection and go over overcompensate. Let me fix it. Let me fix it. And maybe I go on a bit of a kind of a, a roll with that for a bit because I'm, I'm so in my head and I'm so focused on trying to fix it that I don't catch myself kind of going into usually with perfectionistic overcompensating, you're going to see a bit of a burnout spiral. And then I'll get to a point where you go, hang on a minute, this isn't working. This isn't making me feel good. This isn't actually taking my vulnerability away. It's masking it, but it's not addressing it or it's not dealing with it. And I get that voice in the back of my head that says, Jessica, slow down. Right? So that's when my healthy adult starts to kick in and goes, whoa, hang on a minute, like stop, have a look at what you're doing. Are you doing that thing again where you go over the top and you try and fix everything all the time? Yes, 
Okay, does, it, does that work? No, right, what do you need to do? And for me, my self-soothe strategy is usually is a go-to, go make a cup of tea. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that, it's me being able to say, this isn't working, it's not a long-term solution. Yes, I can engage my skills to try and resolve the problem, but I don't need to be perfectionistic about it. There's a difference between kind of compensating for a problem and overcompensating for a problem. So the healthy adult is the one that probably helps me to kind of rein that in a bit and make it a bit more realistic and drag it from dysfunctional back into functional. Yes, go get the problem solved. I don't want you to give up because otherwise you're flipping into compliance surrender. Mm. But to actually be able to kind of go, you don't have to be perfect at all times. Okay. That doesn't make you more lovable. That's not going to fix a vulnerability. You actually need to care for the vulnerable. Like recognize that you're feeling triggered by that voice in your head or by the mistake that you made. But flipping into perfectionistic overcompensator isn't the only way to resolve this. Okay. Okay. So we've got in, in terms of the activation of the of the pain or the the, the you know the, when the vulnerable child gets cued. Yeah. All right. When are you saying that? Um, so something happens in your environment. Mm -hmm. Is that like a representation of the punitive? It could be. Parent? It could be. It, I mean, for some people, it's as simple as they drop their pen and someone noticed, and that's enough to trick off, to kind of okay. kick off that vulnerable, um, the punitive parent rather. Okay. But for others, it will be they tried really hard, or it's it's the kid who takes the maths test up to dad and says, "Look, I got ninety five percent of my maths test," and dad says, "Well, where's the other five percent?" That's going to be kind of the manifestation of where it's kind of it's another thing that would be fueling those dysfunctional okay. parent modes. Okay, so it's a rocket. Of, so things that happen in your in your day to day world that, that stir you up um, is an echo of that sort of punitive parent. Yeah, and look for some people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, it's going to be either an it'll either be triggered by something that happens internally. So you've dropped your pen. You maybe you're the only one that sees it, but that's still enough for your punitive parent to kick off oh, about so it. Stupid. I'm so stupid. Yeah, yeah. it's that. Yeah. Or someone else can actually say something or point it out. And may, maybe they meant it as a completely innocuous of, oh, I see you dropped your pen. But we then internalise it of, I'm such an idiot, they think I'm stupid, I've made a fool of myself, so oh my God. Yeah. So yeah. for some people, that punitive parent or that inner critic has got a megaphone. And I see this when I'm working with patients from a schema point of view, is that inner critic is so loud that it can take something as simple as dropping a pen and turn it into this almighty catastrophe that leads to this kind of massive spiral of vulnerability. Oh, I think this is an important point because what, what you're getting at here is, I mean, this is sort of the bleeding obvious as well, but there is a, a big vari variation amongst people about how sensitive they are. Yeah. Like some people, you know, they're sort of practically bulletproof, it seems, uh, and other people kind of, you know, are in a tiz yeah. over dropping their pen, you know, so, so... We look at how much temperament has to do with that. Yeah. Okay, so temperament is the earliest forms of personality. It's what we're born with as babies. And looking yeah. after kids, you yeah. see some kids are really easy to settle, they'll go to sleep, they'll eat whatever you feed them, and then you've got other kids that will cry at everything, they won't go to sleep, yeah. they're hard to settle, they're, they're more emotionally sensitive. So that comes down to temperament. And where we see this sort of model apply, which originally was developed for borderline personality disorder, mind you, mm -hmm. most people who've experienced BPD would also have a hypersensitive temperament. And the mm -hmm. research there shows that a normal person, I hate that word, but for the sake of the, explaining the research, would experience between 30 to 100 emotional events per day. That would mean that throughout a course of a day, there'd be 30 to 100 things that would maybe kind of tap into this a little bit. Okay. For someone with a hypersensitive temperament, the research suggests they have up to 300 emotional events wow, per day. Wow, that's brutal. Okay, so all, all day long, all wondering, day long. They're, they're tripping over sort of various cues that yeah. stir them up. Yeah. So okay. this thing is, is just sensitive. It, it's almost like you've got someone with third degree burns. They are so raw mm. and so exposed and every single neuron is a, is a nerve pathway is open to getting triggered or getting cued yeah. or something happening. I, and I think what can happen um, uh, sort of in my, in my experience is, is when, when people um, are, are so sensitive, they can almost sort of be on the lookout for the next thing. So they're, they're yeah. sort of collecting stuff yeah. that other people mightn't even notice yeah. because they're, they're sort of I think that maybe maybe it's it's an attempt to try and defend themselves, but it has the opposite effect because yeah. you tend to just get more. It's the confirmation bias. That's it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. if you buy a new car and it's a white Mazda, then all of a sudden you start seeing all the other white Mazdas that are on the road. Same sort of thing yeah. as this. If you perceive yourself as being 
flawed, then you look for all the information in your environment that reinforces this idea that you're flawed. Yeah. Okay. Now, so on, I think I've got a, I think I've got a reasonable grasp. Um, maybe you could just just flesh out the angry child because I'm, okay. I'm with you on the vulnerable child. Are you saying that the the vulnerable child reflexes to to anger, and that's where one of these mode thing kicks in? I'm not. I didn't, I didn't quite so sometimes you can go from vulnerable straight into the fight flight freeze yeah. as a way of. These ones are usually more of a way of trying to deal with a vulnerability and almost create distance from the vulnerability. Whereas these two are more linked. So when we feel vulnerable, like if let's say you've purchased something from a store and, it, and it's not working and you've got to go back and, and fix it, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have that kind of, you take it to the store and say, look, this isn't working. And they go, oh, well, you're probably just not using it right. We might get a little bit angry. We're kind of, well, no, the product is broken, okay? So I just bought a Bluetooth um, <laughs> pair of headphones that don't work and I was talking to Jess about this. So why don't we use this as an example, okay? okay so right. rather than just being hypothetical. Okay. So, bought, so bought these headphones and they were expensive, right? And I got them home and the bloody things won't work, okay? So if we want to try and put this into this kind of thing, okay, so let's there, was some angry, there was some angry child going on when this happened. And then I think I said to you, I'm, I'm thinking about just chucking them in the bin. So that sounds yeah, like compliant surrender a, maybe? Uh, or or no, bully attack? Or what's going yeah, on there? a bit of avoid and protect. <laughs> no, because you said, I don't want to have to go back to the shop that you bought them from. And deal and with the headache. Yeah. So that's more of your avoid and protect. Yeah, right. I'm just going to chuck them out rather than having <laughs> going back to the store to get the return. Okay? okay? But let's say you did put your big boy pants on, you went to the store and you did the return okay. and they're being, will, really, <laughs> being really dismissive of you. Yeah. And that's where the angry oh, child... Oh, well, angry child would come out, I think, because well, I'm, a bit, I'm a bit frustrated about the whole thing. So I can course. see angry child coming out. Okay, so angry child is coming out because your needs aren't being met. Yeah. Hey, buddy, these are wrong. I only bought them last week. They were broken the minute I got them home. You need to replace them. Yeah. Okay? Which is different to angry protector, which is more like if you start yelling and swearing with the idea of pushing people away... But yeah. that's not what you need in this situation. What you need is to actually draw people in to get your needs met. Yeah. You don't need to protect yourself from the people at the store. You need okay. your need your needs met. So you're drawing them in. So I need my healthy adult to, so your healthy to adult take me to, to there and, and, and engage in healthy <laughs> behaviours and get my things sorted out. But your healthy adult needs to come in to make sure you're regulating your angry child. Because if you walk in there and, and throw a it. tantrum... They're probably not going to be too willing to engage with you. Whereas if you can kind of walk in there and assertively express, look, I bought these, here's my receipt, they're not working, I would appreciate a, dis a refund or a exchange or whatever. And if they're being dismissive, say, look, like I've got my rights in terms of customer service and blah, blah, all yeah. of that stuff. Of If you're not getting the answer, okay, can I please speak to a manager? And you've got healthy adult appropriate ways yeah. of so you're going to be a good situation. parent right now in this discussion aren't you yeah, right. okay 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 cool so now i just got to be the happy child so we can you probably... be happy child once you get the headphones working once you get a new pair of headphones you be all a happy right. child and you can listen to your right. music then beautiful all right i think i think we've covered it do you think yeah. we've covered it the biggest reason why i like presenting this model to yeah. my patients um and usually I, I do this in a group setting because it's the sort of work that i do is if you don't know it, you can't change it. Mm -hmm. So this model for me is all about developing insight and awareness and noticing patterns. Mm -hmm. In terms of actually making changes to all of these modes, I strongly encourage people that like you need someone who is actually a schema therapist to work through this schema therapy yeah. with you. It's a very unique, um, almost niche area of therapy that thankfully is growing in Australia. Um, it's huge in the US and in Europe but it's relatively new for us over here. Yeah. There are more and more people who are getting more familiar with this model and able to work within kind of this conceptualization. But for the patient, for the person who's experiencing this, and everyone experiences this to some mm. degree. Everyone's got a vulnerable child. Everyone's got an angry child. Everyone's gonna have a bit of an inner critic. We've all got the voice in the back of our head that says, oh, that was stupid. Mm. It's just a question of how loud is it? How strong is it? How much does it interfere with your day-to-day -day life? So you've got to have awareness in order to create change. Yeah. So the, the awareness, if this is where um, having some mindfulness of what's going on and presumably if, like, you, can, you can listen to this recording and you can sort of uh, have that framework in your mind, okay? But then having the mindfulness sort of in real life, yeah. okay? So that's going to take some practice, right? Yeah. So this is where you'd, 
you dissect what happened last week with your skin yeah. therapist and they'd go, oh, that sounds like you were using a uh, detached protector yeah. in this instance. Yeah. And then yeah. the person would be like, oh, yeah, it yeah. was. Okay, yeah. right, okay. And then you collect enough data that you start to make those realisations. I guess, and I mean, if you can chuck in some, some mindfulness for the self-awareness, um, that would probably be helpful too. Yeah, I would, and I, I, I want to just clarify, when we talk about mindfulness, we're not talking about sitting in a corner with your legs crossed and breathing. No, no, just being it's aware of your thoughts. Mindfulness your is emotions. being yeah. aware of yourself. It's... It's more around tuning into yourself yeah. and having that awareness of what's happening within you, around you, as it's going on. Okay. Okay. So, so if I if I'm someone who um, is getting stirred up a lot, so someone with high sensitivity, and if that is uh, that's very likely. I mean, it could be temperamental, yeah. okay, or it could be yeah. to do with childhood experiences, yeah. or probably both. Not usually okay? both. So then I've got a lot of vulnerable childhood going yeah. on, okay, and I'm you know I'm having some difficulties, mm -hmm. that's where I might see someone to do some schema work, yeah. okay? I would learn this model, yeah. okay? And then I understand the, well, not only the language, but also I can then relate to these emotional processes that are occurring in me. Mm -hmm. And that lets me realise I'm doing things that are maybe maladaptive, yeah. okay? And then I can try and reinforce sort of healthy adult behaviours. Um, and then hopefully there's less getting stirred up. So the vulnerabilities are still there. The vulnerabilities but, are still there. But they're there. not they're not as stirred up. But it's or also they're about better when they're more adaptively defended. It's more around managing it. So when it does get stirred up, you've actually got a response that actually helps you to process the vulnerability instead of masking the vulnerability. Yes. So it's it, I don't want people to lose their vulnerable child. Yeah. This is what keeps us human. Yeah. Okay. So, but so the, the the triggers are still going to be out there. The cues are still going to be out there. Mm -hmm. But it's knowing that when you do get cued, how are you going to resolve that? Because this stuff can work in the short term, but none of this is a long term strategy. None of this is functional over long periods of time. So I kind of I'm, I'm kind of to put schema therapy into a into a broader context. Yeah. Or I'll tr let me try. Okay, at the at the at one end. Or so let's say at the bottom at the root, you've got you know, the, the stuff that happened in childhood or the trauma or, or whatever happened, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's the root. So you might do sort of trauma-focused work to deal with that. Maybe. And, right? Or you might not need to because you might just be able to work yeah. here at the schema level. Yeah. So there's like different levels, right? Yeah. Or, uh, or I guess, or, or a sort of a, you know, because I guess there's a lot in um, dis distress management. And that, that sort of kind of to the side, or probably complements this, you know, so if you can manage your distress better, that then allows you to figure out where you're at here and allows you to act in a more healthy manner. Mm. Okay. But a really talented schema therapist is going to have enough tricks up their sleeve. And within schema therapy, we use a lot of what we call experiential techniques. So mm. stuff like CBT, so cognitive behavioral therapy, it's much, it's much more kind of pen and paper and think about this and go and do this. Mm -hmm. And so there's more of kind of instructional work in the session and then kind of the practice that happens outside of the session. Whereas with schema therapy, it's got this very strong experiential component to it where the therapist can actually work with the patient in the session to create change. An example of that would be something like memory rescripting, where you take the memory and you effectively rewrite the ending. An incredibly powerful technique that can deal with a trauma. So okay. schema... So People don't necessarily need to go and do the trauma yeah. work first. Sorry. It can be encompassed within and these if you've got a schema therapist who knows those particular set of yeah. techniques. And that, that rescripting is that's kind of about okay, what what would a good parent have done in that situation? Yeah. What what kind of should have happened in that situation? Yeah. Well, what did the vulnerable child need? It's about uh, addressing yeah, okay. the needs of the vulnerable child. Okay. And ideally, we want to kind of train the patient to be able to learn how to meet their own needs. Yeah. Yeah, I think we've got it. Good. All right. Um, yeah, I think we can probably leave it there. Okay. All right, All right. good. Thanks, Jess. No worries.